A very good evening, everybody. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank everybody, uh, those of you that attended the talk at Sabah Society uh, last night, um, Thursday, the 7th of December, uh, on my topic of uh, 10 talking points from foreign um, secret files on Sabah, on North Borneo, and the formation of Malaysia. Now, um, the number of points, obviously, the, the talking points is significantly more than what I presented last night. I had to sort of pick 10 points that I thought were very relevant and very important for an audience and for Sabahans and Malaysians to know about what transpired in the lead up to the formation of Malaysia and what transpired during that period and what transpired afterwards. It gives you a better idea of what is going on behind the scenes and how complicated relationships are. The focus tends to be only on two characters, that is Tun Fuat Stevens and uh, Tun Mustafa, but there are other characters behind the scenes that play a very significant and a very important role in making a decision whether to participate in the Union of Malaysia. They also are very alarmed um, by the idea of merging. There is a significant shift in the decision making from no, we're not going to join the Union and we'll to maybe we'll think about it, to yes, we're going to join. So uh, this happens in a very short period of time, within a period of 12 months. Right, who am I? Okay, um, I was born down the road, Queen Elizabeth, 1972, 6 a.m. in the morning. I grew up in Likas, uh, 1972, a few doors down from the home of Tun Fuat Stevens. The house is called Joretta. That was the original name of the house. And um, my family knew the Stevens uh, at that time. I was very young. I never really knew. My earliest memories growing up uh, in summer at that time, my father was working with the, the, the uh, government. One of the most difficult aspects of our family history is that because of my father's religion, he could never get a full-time contract permanent job with the government because he was not a certain religion. But that was the politics of that particular period of time. It's just unfortunate. That's the way it was, historically. Um, but we moved forward and uh, I moved to Labuan. My father moved to Labuan for employment. I grew up on the island of Labuan. My great-great-grandfather arrived in Labuan in 1868 to serve as a policeman with one of the coal mining companies there. And um, yeah, so that's basically who I am. Now, as I move on to the next topic, I'm going to ask two things of you. There are many people here tonight from very diverse backgrounds. How many of you have negotiated deals? You've sat down with somebody and you've tried to negotiate something. In life, I think we've all had to do it, whether it's selling a house, a property, a car, a legal case, trying to find a settlement trying to mediate something, you're trying to convince somebody of, to side with you, to agree with you. It's one of the hardest things to do in life. I've done quite a number over the last 25 years, 24 years that I've been here. And sometimes you win, sometimes you, it just falls through, doesn't happen. Sometimes you meet halfway. You, let, you sort of say, well, okay, let, let, let's meet halfway, let's get the deal done. I bring this up because it will be relevant towards the end of this talk. And I'll come back to this point, negotiating and persuading somebody to come to your side, to listen to you and to agree with what you're proposing. Now, what I'm gonna show may be something a little bit different. You may have a different perception. These are all based on uh, 9,000 documents. It's <coughs> more than 9,000 declassified documents from the British and Australian archives. Uh, they are diplomatic documents that were not meant to be shared with the public. They are meant for uh, ambassadors and embassy diplomatic staff to share information. In, it is intelligence information being shared within the diplomatic core. Uh, and you will find, I found, the British and the Australians are sharing information back and forth between themselves. The Americans, not so much, but the British are dealing with the Americans for the most part. The Australians share information with the Americans when they need to, but everybody is sort of holding their own space, meaning that they're not 
agreeing on everything. But that's my overall impression looking at the 9,000 documents over the last 10 months. This project has grown in size from what it originally was. Um, Institute Development uh, Studies of Sabah uh, invited me to work on, with them on this particular project. So we are currently working on a book. Um, we've gone through a few stages of the book and it needs another, I think some, some minor editing, some changes to it. And we hope it will come out at some point in time next year. So we are progressing along. So this project is very much um, IDS wanting to know more about our past and trying to understand the MA63 situation. How did we get there? What actually transpired in negotiating and uh, all the private discussions that were going on? One of the fascinating things when looking through these documents is that a lot of the characters are already well known, but it's what's going on. The, the intelligence officers, the diplomats, have a front row seat to what's going on between the political parties, between individuals, how they see things, how they see Malaysia. Um, and sometimes they are sharing information. And some of the stuff is sensitive, which is probably why I haven't shared everything. Um, but I've picked on 10 key points. And what I'm going to present tonight is 10 key points that I thought you should understand about the world around Sabah in the lead up to 1963. And then I've also selected certain events that will give you a better understanding of how we got to where we are today. Uh, so it, the documents cover pre-merger, the early years leading up to the merger, the union, what happens after. Uh, there's also quite a bit on the confrontasi as well, intelligence reports, movement of, um, of troops and so forth, combat reports. Uh, there's also quite a bit on the Philippine claims. We actually now suddenly have access. This, this helped a lot for us to understand what was going on with the Sulu claim. It, there are some, doc, some information in there that help me to better understand what was going on in, as far as the Philippine side was concerned and who was doing what. So that was very, very helpful to have a better understanding. Um, Indonesian sentiments are play a very prominent role in the files. You'll find the Indonesians are very unhappy with the formation of Malaysia. It's one of those things they just absolutely do not want to happen. So they're doing everything they can to, to sort of stop it. And of course, the European opinions. What do the Americans think? What do the British think? What do the Australians think? It's basically these three governments that play a, a pretty vital role in the formation of Malaysia. And the fact is that if you look at the records, they are basically already decided it's going to be this way. Um, there's a book that's coming out sometime, I think May, April, May. Uh, it's a book uh, by Dr. James Harder and Dr. Danny Wong, Professor Danny Wong. Um, it is based on interviews with the journalist and eventually newspaper editor. So he's, he's um, had a private discussion with James Sarda and Professor Danny. He shared quite a bit of insight. Um, I had a very brief read of it. I think the first two versions, edits that they did, um, I gave my opinions, but again, it's their project, their book, so looking forward to reading it when it does come out. So, Fauzi does cover some interesting parts. Some of it you've read in Daily Express previously in his write-up. Some of it is a little bit new. So, so um, I was very privileged. I had the opportunity uh, to talk to Tan Sri Thomas Jaya Surya before he passed, um, and um, to be able to talk to him very short, very, very short um, talks. And getting information out of him is not exactly very easy. Uh, you, I have a question asked and you don't always get the answer you want. Sometimes he's just very reluctant to answer. But what was very interesting is that I got a better understanding of why things changed so suddenly in 1967. How did Uncle, Upco suddenly just disintegrate? And it did. It's what's going on in the prelude leading up to 1967 that seals their fate. There are, there are things that are going on that they do not realize going on in the background and they are also basically doing a number of things that will in the end lead to their demise, unfortunately. It's not just, a lot of people tend to blame to Mustafa, a lot of people tend to blame another character called Said Tuchik, some of you may have heard of him. They play a role but it's not entirely them and they're not entirely to blame for what happens to Akko and So yeah, so I, was very also very privileged that I got 
quite a large uh, cache of uh, documents from uh, Tan Sri's library, political documents and files, so a bit slowly going through. Um, there's some very interesting stuff in there, but I will, I'm still working on it, so I haven't done a first edit yet, but I'm hoping by the end of next year it will be done. Okay, so let's start with the point number one, the immediate threats to Borneo in 1963. So this is what some of the documents look like. The top secret documents, you will have top secret, and the documents will have a reference number and so forth, and they come in uh, quite a large number of files which have been scanned in a PDF to preserve them. Uh, so this is the Australians communicating within themselves, among themselves, the two dangers must face. So this is 1963 in July just before the formation. They are still talking about the extension of communist aggression into Malaysia, which includes the Borneo ter uh, territory. So they are worried communism is spreading in their minds. Um, it's also what's going on in Vietnam as well. The Americans are not exactly having things all their way. The French have been badly defeated and removed from Vietnam. The Americans coming in. 63 is a very hot year up there. And the Americans are very sensitive to the spread of communism, even um, and I'll explain why as well once I head to Sukarno as well. Aggression by Indonesia in the Borneo territories, either in support of an uprising by someone such as Azahari, who's a politician from Brunei, uh, or because Indonesia wishes to incorporate the Borneo territories in public. Brunei, Indonesia does have ambitions for North Kalimantan. Sabah was meant to be North Kalimantan. So the ambitions are there. In their mind, Sukarno would like Sabah and Sarawak to be incorporated into uh, a greater Kalimantan. And of course, we have different ideas, and the British have different ideas, and the Australians are absolutely against it. Right? No. So Karno is very favorable. He has very good relationships with China. He also starts to purchase, and also has relationships with the Russian Soviet Union. He starts to purchase the most modern uh, jet bombers from the Soviet Union, as well as weapons and so forth. So, that alarms everybody once he starts acquiring all these new aircraft, especially the bombers. In fact, there's a story about a Russian Tupolev bomber actually for, or flying over Kota you know, Jesselton at that time, actually dropping leaflets. So that's how ambitious they were. That's how much they just, we didn't really have anything to put up in the early 60s to counter anything like that flying, you know, any sort of enemy aircraft or foreign aircraft flying over Borneo. We didn't have anything to put up didn't really see any point. The British didn't see any point in having a, a large air force in Labuan and so forth. The Australians are so worried the Indonesians are going to cause them problem. This is from January, February, March 63. This is an interdepartmental uh, um, document that's sent from one embassy to another. This is from Jakarta. I know this is from Jakarta, the embassy in Jakarta, the High Commission of Jakarta. We should speak to the Indonesians. We have no objection to the eventual incorporation of Portuguese Timor in Indonesia. They're basically saying, we're not going to stop you. If you go and claim Portuguese Timor from, from you want to go and get it, fine. We're not going to, going to interfere. But the advantages of explaining our attitude to Timor, the danger of taking a hard line over Malaysia with the Indonesians is that they will conclude that we are hostile to them. They are bound to see our attitude of Malaysia in better perspective if we're able to show them that where this does not conflict with Australia's vital interests, we desire to reach a modus vivendi with them. I presume this is, look, as long as they don't interfere with the, the Malaysian uh, question, they can do what they want. The Australians are basically sacrificing any sort of interference as far as Portuguese people. The Indonesians don't go in, I think, till the early 70s. Um, so yeah, but eventually they do. The Australians are saying, well, just go ahead. You can have that, but just don't disturb the, uh, the plan for Malaysia. Of course, we know that the Indonesians ignore this. Next, please. So this is back to July 1963. <coughs> and um, I think we need to cut this one. Uh, OK. And this is the enemy of my enemy is my friend. I, I use this phrase because uh, this is from Manila, the Australian embassy in Manila. So they, they've basically written a report. The Filipinos fear and dislike the Indonesians. Per contra, the Indonesians despise the, and I had to censor that particular word out, <coughs> the Filipinos as being American stooges. It should not be part of our policy to throw them into each other's arms. We have to encourage them both to collaborate, which they do. They actually do collaborate and start interfering with um, the formation of Malaysia. They're, they're trying their hardest to, to interfere. 
I'm not sure if you're aware, the Philippines actually proposed that they be a part of Malaysia. They wanted to be a part of the formation of Malaysia. It suddenly turned up with a letter from, I can't pronounce the name, Magabagal. I can never pronounce the name. Uh, uh, President sends a letter to Tunku and proposes just before the formation of Malaysia in uh, September 63. He said, well, look, I tell you what, why don't the Philippines also join this union as well? So it's the Philippines, Singapore, Borneo, territories, and Malaya. Let's all come together. This proposal is ignored, including the British just ignore this proposal. Next, please. The Russians are interfering. They're not happy as well. So Radio Moscow actually reaches to Singapore. So uh, the Australian Embassy in Singapore is, is, is taking note of uh, Radio Moscow, their radio... Um, what, what do the radio stations do? They <coughs> announce, what, transmit. Uh, so they have an actual station that is actually uh, reading out content. And they're denouncing the Malaysian Prime Minister Tunku Rama, the Malayan Prime Minister Tunku Rama, as the main actor in the British plot in this Malaysia scheme. The Russians launched a skating indictment of the proposed Malaysia Federation, which is to unite all the territories into a new nation next of August. So there's a campaign going on from Radio Moscow to encourage people to go against this um, union of territories to form Malaysia. Next, please. This is one of several things that, as far as the claim over Sabah is concerned, uh, you will find, I've done my very best to try and understand Tunku Rahman's character, the way he sees the world, how he acts, um, and not only as a leader, but also as a prince, royalty, um, as a human being, and very friendly person, respectable, uh, a gentleman above all things, but he has this one thing which he, is a bit of a problem, is that he just doesn't take some things, can become problems later, seriously. So the British are complaining, hey, you know, he's not listening to us, we're warning him of this claim, over Sabah. The Philippines are going to start this claim. We know who's doing it and who's encouraging it. We've been telling him, but he just doesn't seem to listen. He's not taking it seriously. He only takes it seriously until it becomes too late. And it becomes an issue in the Philippines, and the Philippines is threatening, look, we're going to take this to the UN, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And then he gets really agitated. So, next please. Okay, so you may not have known this, but the UK actually seriously thought about giving Sabah to the Philippines. Uh, this is in a correspondence uh, over North Korea. This is from between Canberra and the Philippine Embassy. Last year, where on the 30th of October 1956, last year when the UK was seeking Filipino labor to encourage the cooperation of the Philippine government, let it be known that the United Kingdom would much prefer to see North Korea go to the Philippines than to see go to Indonesia. So they actually thought about it. There's only one document that suggests this, no other document. So I would suggest that this may have been suggested by the ambassador of the Australian Embassy in Manila, Mick Shan, but it didn't go anywhere. It was ignored. Next, please. Okay, so many theories why the British just packed up and left, why they were forcing us down this path of um, independence, we didn't really get independence, and forcing us on the part to form uh, Malaysia. So I'll just give a few indications of what is reported in documents and what I've discovered as well. The Suez Canal crisis of 56, the British make a catastrophic mistake with France and Israel invading Egypt, trying to recover the Suez Canal. It's an epic uh, mistake for a number of reasons. Number one, it hits the, hits the economy very badly. Uh, the British economy suffers tens of millions in cash reserves, uh, losses in cash reserves, because of the devaluation of the British pound as a result of what transpires. Um, and this leads to economic panic. People are selling the pound. The United Nations threaten sanctions unless Britain and France and Israel stop the invasion of Egypt. So the United Nations are very late now. And they have the support of the Arab nations as well. The Arabs are starting to now um, come together against colonialism. 
This is the first time that Britain and France have been defeated in a war since 1914. But, but this time, what's significant? It's by an Arab nation. It's not by another Western power, yeah. European power. It's the Arabs that have won this first time. The other thing that's significant, the US actually doesn't side with them during this invasion of Egypt. The US is actually really, really upset. They've told them not to do it, they've gone ahead and done it, and they say, well, we told you not to do it, and you've gone against our wishes, and you've gone and done it. Britain goes to the IMF, International Monetary Fund, asking for loans because of the economic crisis they have. The US pressures the IMF, don't give them any loans until they withdraw. But even then, the relationship is spoiled a little bit. The other problem with this is that the Soviet Union gets involved. They are supplying arms and weapons to some of the Arab nations, including Egypt. Jordan, Syria are receiving economic aid and weapons um, from the Soviet Union. So this could threaten to be an actual NATO war. And this is what the US doesn't want. They're worried they're going to be dragged into a war in the Middle East that they don't want to. So it's NATO against the Soviets. Next, please. Communism has spread within Southeast Asia. Yes, there is, my findings, there is a little bit, it, it has been suggested, well, communism has spread to Sarawak, it has spread to Sabah, no, Sabah, no, I've not seen any indication it has spread to Sabah. There were some leaflets <coughs> being passed around in some schools by some teachers uh, in 1961, 62, but the teachers were then packed up and sent back to Hong Kong. And you don't see really, somehow we don't really have a problem in communism. It's not a real threat. Sarawak, they had some interference from across from the Communist Party in Kalimantan, did cause some interferences. There's some suggestion that the Brunei Rebellion, they were also involved in it. So it's one of those things that I think it's a little bit hard to pinpoint if they were directly involved in that or not. I don't believe they were, but they were certainly active. A little bit more active in, in Sarawak, definitely not in Sabah. Indonesian period of nationalism, and of course, like, as I mentioned, they are buying weapons from the Soviets. They've got a modern air force. Sabah, North Korea doesn't have anything of that capability. We're dependent on the Australians and the British. Primarily, their bases are in Labuan and Butterworth and Singapore. World opinion by this period of time, 1960, late 1950s, has turned against Britain. Britain is no longer as popular as people would like to believe the British are having a PR nightmare this period of time. As I said, the United Nations are unhappy and they begin this process of pressuring Britain to decolonize. Now, this comes about with the 1960 UN resolution, colonial foreign rule, which basically says that colonization is a violation of human rights. The decolonization has started before this, but it's speeded up a lot more once this comes into play. Doctor? Yes. Can we say that Malaysia actually is a United Nations project? No. No? No. It's a British project. The British project. Yeah. The UN get involved. The UN do come around, they have in their mind their own ideas, and they are being pressured by the Philippines and Indonesia. They are being pressured, you know, they say, look, this, this Cobalt Commission thing is not enough. We want some sort of referendum, we want proof that the people of North Borneo and Sarawak actually want this. And so the British and the Australians say, look, we've got to delay this. If they want anything on that, it's got to be after Malaysia is formed. So mm -hmm. they do talk about this, but I would say no. The Indonesia, sorry, the UN, the Malaysia is not a formation of the UN, mm -hmm. from my understanding what I've seen. But the approval, the final approval was given Yeah, definitely, them. they had to. But they, they are trying, they are trying because they're getting pressure, uh, 62 into 63, there is a lot of pressure to, to, to have something a little bit more concrete than the Cobalt Commission. Mm -hmm. But again, I come back to this point, the British and Australians say no. Whatever it is, delay, do what you have to do, talk to, uh, there's a gentleman that sent from the United Nations specifically to discuss this matter, I'm trying to remember his name, he's not the Secretary General, it's one guy below him, and his name comes up prominently, he's got a Burmese name, but anyways, he, he tries, the Philippines and Indonesia are pressuring him, 
we've got to stop this, we've got to delay this, we want to have some sort of a, a firmer referendum, and they just say no. Uh, the other problem also is the economic cost to maintain the colonies. It's not cheap. Um, the British are spending more on North Borneo and Sarawak than they actually are getting in returns. They don't have the mass timber projects going on that we have in the late 60s and the 70s like they do at this period of time. It all comes later. The wealth comes later for the state territory. Next please. If you look, precedents have been set from 55. Okay, India, uh, Palestine, uh, that's 47 or so. But look at what happens from 55 all the way down to 66. You see all these countries are getting decolonized. It's not just us. It's many other countries. Cocos, 55, Sudan, 56, Ghana, 57, Christmas Islands, and Cocos go to Australia, 58. Somaliland gets incorporated, uh, and 60 into, into Ethiopia, I think. Uh, Cyprus, 60 again. North Cameroon gets split in half, and South Cameroon gets split as well in 61. So it's not the first time territories are getting split to form other nations. It's, it's pretty common, it's already happening in Cameroon. Tanzania, so you can see what I'm talking about. Precedence has been set. We're down here. All these countries already started before us. So the British have started decolonizing. There is an argument that the British had already planned for decolonization before the end of the war and just after the war. I think it's referring to Stockholm. Um, I don't think this applies to us. Um, because they went and acquired, the British went and acquired North Borneo from, and Sarawak from, uh, yeah, especially North Borneo, they acquired it from the Charter Company. They didn't have to. They were in so much of debt after the war. They owed so much of loaned uh, debts to America and Canada. Why would you want to go and take on a territory that you have to fund? But they did. And knowing that, they rebuilt North Borneo, which Australians and Americans had destroyed most of our time. Next, please. So this is what the covers of the documents, the folders look like. This is just a sample. I'm not going to put all of them up. I'll use this just as a generic model for the slides I'm going to show. It doesn't change. Uh, so the first discussions about a, uh, a, a union has nothing to do with Malaya. It is purely Borneo. The question of a Borneo union. So I walk North Borneo and Brunei. So it starts as early as 1953 in Kuching, the Kuching Conference. Uh, it sort of becomes an embryo of some sort of federation for Borneo territories. So this is where the <coughs> federation of Borneo territories is suggested. And it's seriously discussed in a conference. December 56, an intelligence report, Borneo merger unlikely to appeal to the Sultan of Brunei. And I'll get to it, I'll get to that point why. <coughs> Sultan of Brunei is also still unhappy, he's still really irritated that his father had to give up uh, Limbang, part of the corridor of Sarawak that separates Tumuro in two. So he's still upset about that. And he's hinting at them, why don't you just give it back? Why don't you just give it back? But of course, Sarawak doesn't want to do that. Next, please. January 57, another intelligence report. The colonial office believes the best solution is a merger of all three territories. They're, they're encouraging it. Sarawak, Colonial officers, not Borneo colonial, colonial officers, all believe that this is the best solution going forward. Now, Brunei, the colonial officers in Brunei come from Sarawak. They are under Kuchinki envision the problems that were to come in the future. It's actually been pretty bright, it's pretty spot on, I would say. Next, please. Okay, 7th of August, 1958. Uh, this is from the High Commissioner, D.W. McNichol. The Sultan of Brunei is frightened. Too much democracy will reduce his authority and diminish his financial resources. He doesn't want to share the wealth. He has no interest in sharing the oil wealth with Sarawak, North Borneo. Why do I want to? Why, what benefit does it give me to share with them? Uh, and he's mindful of what happened to all the Indian princes when India uh, got its independence in 47. They all basically lost their powers and their rule. And also what he saw was happening to the sultans in Malaya. In, uh, that period of time, 58, so I presume there's some things going on in Malaya at that period of time, that the sultans are not having things their way. I don't know this part for a fact what's going on in Malaya. Next, please. 
58, again, looking into this merging, let's, let's try again and talk about it. Let's try and convince Brunei it's in their interest to participate. At this point in time, you suddenly now see the North Borneo colonial officers are saying, well, actually, we don't really want to merge. We're quite happy with things the way they are. They don't represent the British government. This is the North Borneo colonial officers that are here. They say, look, I think let's just leave things as they are. We don't see any benefit. If Brunei is not going to be a part of it, what's the point? Sarawak is as poor as us, so what's the point? So this source comes from the Attorney General of Sarawak in 16 December 1958. Next, please. So I talked about 58 as well, the same uh, intelligence report. I talked about Brunei and Sarawak native leaders not getting along. This is that old problem that I talked about. They don't really want to work and cooperate with each other. And the Sarawakians also, you sort of see in this report, the Sarawakians themselves don't want to have anything to do with Brunei. And this goes back into that old problem where Brunei ruled over Sarawak as well. They still remember Brunei oppression in the old days, 100 years before. So. Next, please. Okay, so now uh, we get to interesting stuff. In 1958, okay, so when we use the word Chinese in North Borneo, we're talking about the Tau case of North Borneo. Okay, it's the Tau case of North Borneo. The Tau case become very important in the formation of Malaysia. We talk the Tau case, and these are the rich Chinese businessmen, for the most part, they're in Sendaka. Uh, and I'll name them as well afterwards. And they are quite happy with British rule, colonial rule. They have their timber concessions. They are very comfortable with the way things are. Their opinion is very important. And of course, they are the wealthiest in North Borneo. But uh, they play a very pivotal role moving forward in the formation of Malaysia. Uh, they also are very, very wary of Singapore having an influence. They're not so confident, not so comfortable with the Chinese in Singapore because they find them a little bit aggressive. It, you know, in their minds, like, they've got a very different way of looking at things from us, uh, which is pretty common even now. We see things very differently from other people in other, other areas of Malaysia as well. So maybe that's just carried forward. I'm not so sure. but. They also do not see any economic benefits of the Chinese Tau case. saying, what's the point of joining? What do we gain uh, with Sarawak? In their mind, is basically, I come back to this point. What's the point? Unless Brunei is going to be a part of Brunei is going to share its wealth with us. Otherwise, there's no logic for us to join, to merge. Next, please. August 1962. No political party in North Borneo can claim to have a substantial following. This is August 1962. Very important. The date. We're one year, roughly one year away from the formation of Malaysia. So nobody really, they're not. The, the problem with the political parties that are formed um, is that they simply don't know what to do. None of them are politicians. Donald Stevens is not a politician. To Mustafa is not a politician. Um, who from Senakan is not a politician. They're businessmen. Stevens is an editor, newspaper editor, writer. Um, Mustafa. He's a man of, of a number of skills. He used to be fought in the Second World War as a in the jungles of North Borneo with um, the Australians. Um, so, yeah, you know, they don't really have the skill set that the Malayans, they've been playing this game much longer. They have experience in politics, they, they know how to play this game. And again, I, I this will be the last part that I'll mention later how things change later, but there's no strategy to mobilize mass support within individual communities either. They don't know what to do. There's no strategy. This is what's being reported. They don't really know what they're doing. You know, they need some help to help guide them. Local politicians are generally noted to be very broad-minded and very tolerant with each other. There's no issue of race. Problems with race. No animosity or narrow communal social political views also stated in the report. There's an appeal for political parties. Sorry, appeal for political parties is more regional and communal or a mix of both. You know, so it's not by race, it's by region. So the Sanakan group, Jasultan group, they're all sort of looking out for each other's interests. Next please. Okay, so formation of Malaysia, we get to sort of that period of time, 1961 to 63. Um, so, for the most part, whenever you read history books and stuff, it sort of focuses on Stevens, 
Brahman and Lee Kuan Yew. We, they tend to ignore Mustafa and uh, Stephen Kalong. What is even more interesting is they ignore all these gentlemen at the bottom here. And these gentlemen at the bottom play a very pivotal role moving forward. Um, Pang Tetsu, of course, he becomes minister later, and then Mustafa. Peter Law becomes chief minister for a very short period of time, interim chief minister. This gentleman here, Ko Siak Chu, very important person, very influential, comes from Sendaka, um, successful businessman, um, very good reputation, very influential, also has influence here in Jesselton as well. So, And he forms his own political party, the United uh, Party in Sendaka. There's another party called Democratic Party, so eventually they merge and uh, collaborate together. Kuan uh, Yu Ming and Yap Pak Yong. So these gentlemen don't get discussed. Very rarely you'll hear them being mentioned as the fathers of North Borneo, <coughs> the founders of North Borneo. It's only really these two gentlemen here. But you have to look at what the document is telling us, and these guys are very influential. They will decide how things will fare for UNCO slash APCO. <coughs> they will decide the fate of APCO as well in 67. Because without them, APCO falls. Next, please. Interesting, 1961, 10th of August in Singapore during the Foreign Correspondents Association luncheon, Donald Stevens just fires away at the chartered company. He is just upset with the chartered company. The chartered company has been a benevolent dictatorship. It was worse than most degenerate form of colonialism, so he is just hammering at them. The idea that human beings were equal, whatever the color of their skins, began to spread. And with the fight for independence going all around us, it was impossible for people not to know of it, this colonialism. If North Borneo joins Malaya now as a state, it would in fact mean that North Borneo would not be a state, but a colony of the Federation of Malaya. These fears are genuine, not actually fear or suspicion of the sincerity of Malaya to take us on as an equal partner, but more the fear that by virtue of our status as a British colony, we would automatically become a second class state or a colony in Malaya. So this is 10th August 1961. This is when he's absolutely against joining, forming any union with Malaya and Singapore. And then he changes one year later. Everything changes. And I think I know where it changes, where he gets influence. We, the United Front, he's talking about Sabah and Sarawak, uh, not Malaysia and Sarawak, are against joining Malaysia as individual states and want the Borneo territories to get together with Malaya as equals, not as vassals. <coughs> People of Borneo did not reject the proposal once and for all. So now he's saying, um, well, we're not going to say no, but we're not going to commit to it. And if we are going to commit to it, it's going to be with Sarawak and Brunei as well. There was no intention on the part of Malaya for any form of colonization of Borneo territories. The Malaysia plan was workable and we must get down to something concrete. Now, this is made, so it is not 27th of July, this is subsequently, one month later, he suddenly changes his tune. He's saying, oh, we didn't say no, let's consider it, maybe it's something we can think about, maybe. So please ignore this part, it's actually this. This was during the Malaysia Solidarity Consultative Committee uh, that was formed 25th August 1961 in Singapore. Next please. Okay, this is very damaging. Uh, I don't know if anybody seen this. This is the UNCO Memorandum to the Cobol Commission dated 23rd of February 1962. Have anybody seen this before? UNCO is Sudan, right? No, no, Stevens. It's a very no, damaging yeah, document. Yeah. And without doubt, <laughs> The Tau case would have seen this. I hope I'm not being disrespectful using the word Tau case, that group, but they are absolutely crucial in this. This is the first time you see Stevens change direction. If North Borneo gets self-government and independence, the heirs, when the British leave, will be the Chinese. So what is he doing here? He's basically telling the Cobalt Commission, hey, you know, you've got to make sure that we get control of the state, not the Chinese. The first time we see this being, being mentioned in that kind of fashion. So, so this is 1962, February. And then something interesting transpires immediately after Tunku suddenly calls the Tau case to care. Next, please. 
called a Tau case. The law coup with Tunku at his house, May 1962. He calls them to care, reconciliatory, trying to convince them you know, the Malaysia plan. He's showing them Kuala Lumpur. You see how modern Kuala Lumpur is. And I'll get to this point, which is very interesting. You know, and just basically trying to change their minds. You know, these guys are just saying, no, it's not a good idea. It's a horrible idea. What's interesting, I actually found this photo. It's in a very important book. Let me just forget it. And if you want to really understand the Chinese observations of the time, and it's very important to understand what's going on in the minds of these gentlemen, who are well, essentially the Tao case, you've got to read this book, The Tao Case of Sabah. Who is a singer? My grandfather. My grandfather. Why he's there? I don't know. <laughs> he was known as Tauke Gurbak Singh. Yes. I come from Afghanistan. Yes. That's my grandfather. So he's the only Indian I've ever heard in the whole of Malaysia who was officially called by the community Tauke. Tauke Gurbak Singh. So that's my grandfather. So, yeah, but if you really want to understand what is in the minds of the Chinese Taukes at that period of time, this book is really good. It gives you an insight. It also tells you what Anko Apko does wrong. Why they alienate Apko? Sorry, why Apko alienates them? Worth reading. Yeah, I still don't know what he was doing there. <laughs> so there's an interesting story. Comes along later when Atul uh, Mustafa is chief minister. Uh, Mustafa sends Haris Saleh, who's a family friend in La from Labuan. He lived a few nearby to our house. So he sends Haris Saleh go and see. Tauke Gurbak Singh and get donation for the building of the Muis building in Sambula. Mm -hmm. So Haris Ali comes, is my grandfather, my grandfather gives him a donation of 50,000 ringgit. 50,000 ringgit is a, it's a lot of money yeah. at that time. So the money, I don't know how, whether it was cash or what was, was donated, I don't know this. <coughs> in fact, Mustafa said, Tauke Gurbak gave 50,000. Mustafa says, go, go back, get some more from him. <laughs> So this is a story that goes in the family from those days. My grandmother told it. So Haris Ali comes back to my grandfather and says, now, you know, Dato said, need more. The grandfather just paid, basically says, you give back my 50,000. Thank you very much, give back my 50,000. So I don't know what happened, but they actually give back my 50,000. Next, please. Okay, so we go to this intelligence report, which is, covers the period of 29th Jan July to the 5th of August 1962. Okay, so this particular document, this is what it looks like. It covers quite a bit for that period of time. It's actually released in September, but it covers this period of time. It comes out a little bit late. Next, please. So they go into start, they're doing an intelligence report on all the individual parties. I'm only going to talk about two parties. Because these two parties play a very crucial role in what happens in the, in the future. As I said, Sundam is just adamant, no, no, no. Um, and he stays consistent with it. This party continues to exist largely as an expression of the Dusun opposition to Uncle and Donald Stevens. They don't like Donald Stevens. Absolutely not. And there's a reason for that as well. Traditionalists, unsophisticated, Principal support derived from the Tusuns and Moros of the interior, who, being ill informed or even ignorant of the current world situation, they're referring to the spread of communism and the realities of Sukarno. I mean, those days there's no internet, there's no nothing, they don't know what's going on in English, they don't know who Sukarno is either. So it's a very different world. All they can hear is what's on the radio. But remember, in those days, radio wasn't really, you know, you couldn't find radio stations around in the early 60s, not like you find it towards the end of the 60s, early 70s, maybe. So they see no necessity for the present colonial regime to change. They're very happy with the British. Why change? We'll be happy with it. We're, everything's peaceful. We're living a nice life. They are opposed to Malaysia in principle, but they would like to achieve independence before deciding whether to associate with Malaysia. So they say, yeah, we, don't, we can consider it later, but we prefer to be independent first. Next, please. Originally planned as a multiracial party. That could be the reason why my grandfather is there. You know, uh, the, the UP has become dominated by the wealthy Chinese. They have some reservations concerning the desirability of Malaysia. Now, this is between July and August 1962. So they've already gone to KL. They've seen Tunku in May. They've read 
UNCLOS memorandum to the Cobalt Commission, which was not very nice to read, um, you know, because they're getting picked on now. So, um, so conversations two days before the announcement of the London Agreement, Mr. Lai and Kong comments that Malaysia might be desirable in the long run. It could come about only after the achievement of self-government and only with adequate safeguards. The United Party are the ones that bring up this point first. We must have safeguards. We can't just go into this blind. They are the first to mention all these safeguard issues. Then, of course, you get... We need to be points. I believe it comes about from them having this worry that we've got to put some safeguards in place here before we talk about, you know, if we're going to go down this path, we've got to get some safeguards. It's the first time that's mentioned the word safeguard appears in any of the documents. So I do not know for a fact that they are the only one thinking about this in July to August 1962 if other parties have thought about this, but this is the first recorded documentation our case of worry. Hey. What's going to happen? Next, please. Uh, Lai also stresses that British officers should be retained for at least five years. Uh, he would appreciate, uh, he, he appreciated that Tung Ta, Tung Wak Rama, is under considerable domestic pressure in Malaya, Malaya within UMNO. He's not talking about everybody in Malaya, he's talking about UMNO. Under considerable domestic pressure to insist that Islam be made a state religion in North Korea. Tunku had not the strength to resist the pressure. There is a danger of exploitation and subversion. This was also on page 6 as well. Next, please. Okay, so uh, further down the intelligence report, there is a meeting between this intelligence officer uh, with uh, Dato Ku, Dato Dr. Peter Lo, Kwan Yu Ming, three of them sit down and they consider the Cobalt report. They actually got the report 14 days before it was released, according to the intelligence report. So, in their mind, it was unfair the inhabitants of Borneo territories had no direct voice in any stage of the negotiations concerning their future. So they say, look, we don't really have a say. It's, it's one or two people making decisions for us, but they haven't talked to us about it. It's silly of the UK to force the Borneo territories into an unnatural union with Malaya, simply to provide a non-communist and non-Chinese counterweight to Singapore. So, um, at the end of August, I did a talk with uh, IDS about um, Sabah Day and the formation of Malaya and stuff. So, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, in his mind, he's adamant, look, we need, to, we need to merge with Malaya. We'll be much stronger with Malaya. We have access to more resources. Singapore is very rich territory, even before the formation of Malaysia. But in their mind, they can see more opportunities if they were to merge with Malaysia. Tunku and Amno don't agree with this. In their mind, they say, we don't want another Chinese population merging with us because it will shift the demographics significantly. But as a counterweight, if we take the Malays, they're not thinking of Rumi Mutras as in Kadalan, Rusu, Buru, they think of Malays. And you see this in the documents. If we get the Malays in Sarawak and Sabah and we're to join, then we get the majority back again. And everybody else who is a native will definitely support us because we will have programs for them that benefits them as well. So we'll be fine if we do that. But you see, the problem is this. The Borneo territories are not interested. Like, oh, no, we're quite happy with ourselves. In fact, not even merging with anybody. But we would like independence. <coughs> Next, please. He continues, if Malaysia was inevitable, it should only come on condition that we were given watertight safeguards. Islam must not be the state religion. The scope of English, they put in Chinese, they put in Kadazan, they don't mention Dusun, uh, also as official languages. Immigration must be controlled by the state. So they've already put some proposals that it's got to be this if we want to even consider it. Right? Next, please. Arrangements must be made about finance, especially taxation. They don't want to be overtaxed. These are businessmen. Why pay more taxes? British officers must be retained until the Borneans were trained to replace them. So they're basically saying we're not ready for any transition or merger. We need time. So they're talking about well, let's be independent first and then we can consider the Malayans, the Malayan, Malaysia question later. It is unrealistic that sovereignty will be safely transferred to Malaya by August 63. They don't think it's possible one year from, from 1962 August. 
well, it's not really realistic, you know, because we haven't got the, we don't have the people to do the job. That's really one of the things that's going to move so many things that we have to talk about, we haven't even got there yet. Right? So the question was asked of the Australian diplomat. Any Australian institutions offering courses of study which would assist the North Borneo political parties to improve the organization? They're asking for help. Is there anything we can do to learn more about politics? These are businessmen, they're not politicians. Next, please. Indicates, so the Australian diplomat in this report, which is page seven, for so his reply is, indicates a degree of political naivety, meaning that they don't really have the experience in politics. Many of the North Borneo politicians are businessmen or professional people who have no political experience, whatever, and who, having entered politics with great reluctance, meaning that they didn't really want to get involved, but they've got no choice, because they're now thinking of the individual communities, are, are now feeling their way, they're sort of trying to learn about politics, that maybe, perhaps, might be indicative of general lines of thought. UP are considering, probably as a last resort, of sending a delegation of protests either to London or the United Nations. So they thought about it, but they didn't do it. Next, please. September 62. Okay, this is the one. Okay, so this carries over into September. On the 4th of September, immediately after the return from the Madeka anniversary celebrations in KL, Donald Stevens and Tom Mustafa convened a special meeting of UNPO and USNO and they reached an agreement on the formation of an alliance between the two parties of the and Sabah Alliance. It was further decided to keep the way open for other acceptable parties to join the alliance. This is a private meeting. They don't invite anybody to this except USNO and UNPO. They do it almost immediately as soon as they arrive, 4th of September. So they come back after the 31st of the celebrations in Kuala Lumpur. Next please. There is a rebellion going on at this period of time within PASOK. There are indications of a pronounced swing of opinion in the ranks of PASOK away from its chairman, OKK Sundan, due to his close association with Miss Helen Chung, sister of Mr. Chung Chao Long, the wealthy and respected Chinese timber magnate from Beaufort, who has been making substantial contributions to the party's funds. Representatives were invited to an all-party meeting convened to consider a united front on Malaysia. So, so what's happened in this instance is that it's over timber licenses. They felt, look, if we go ahead with this, we support the Malaysian um, Union, there is an opportunity to get timber licenses, and these are the senior guys. But when uh, Sundang is against merging or forming, things are not going their way. What they thought was going to happen hasn't happened. They have no, they don't foresee them getting any sort of projects or timber concessions or, or, or licenses, and they're not happy about that. So that's essentially what this rebellion is about. Next please. United Party, uh, public, re public reaction to the London talks was calm. There's no anti-Malaysian demonstrations. United Party had it in mind, they thought about it, but then they decided not to protest. They, indicate they, they decided to indicate their disapproval and distress privately, and especially after more sober counsels prevailing that they had internal discussions or they were advised with those do do that. If you've got anything that you're not happy about, just bring it up privately. So in United Party and PASO are against moving forward with this uh, union. Next, please. Okay, so. 13, 14 August, an all-party meeting was convened by, by Donald Stevens in Jesselton in hope of reaching common agreement on the nature of the safeguards in Malaysia, which North Borneo should seek to obtain. So leading representatives of USNO, UNCO, UP, Democratic Party, and PASO, Sundang was not there, were all present to discuss the safeguards. Next, please. After many hours of discussion in which Dr. Mustafa played a valuable part in reconciling contrary views, agreement was reached on a 14-point program of minimum safeguards for North Borneo's participation in Malaysia. Um, at a subsequent meeting, this was expanded to 20 points. So this is page 8 of this particular intelligence report. Next, please. Uh, a memorandum incorporating them, the 20 points were signed by three reps of each of the five political parties, including PASO presented to Lord Lansdowne and Tun Razak during their visit. 
The three political parties previously opposed Malaysia have now decided not to contest the formation of Malaysia provided the special interests of North Borneo are safeguarded and have combined UNCO Usno to present a united front before the Intergovernmental Committee on the minimum safeguards considered necessary. So they basically say, look, at the end of the day, UNCO and Usno are going to make decisions with us or without us, so we're going to have to depend on them now to ensure that the safeguards are preserved uh, moving forward. Next, please. The friendly attitude and, and frank speaking of Lord Lansdowne and Tun Razak made a favorable impression on those that opposed uh, the formation of Malaysia. Tun Razak did much to allay the fears among the three representatives of Pasok Mamugon. No question of victimizing or persecuting of anyone who held or had anti Malaysian views. So he's basically saying, look, don't worry. It's in the past, let's move forward. We're not going to prosecute anybody. Next, please. Immediately on the 22nd of August, Azahari, Chairman of the Party Rakyat Brunei, and Stephen Yong, Secretary General of SUPP, fly into Kota Kinabalu, Jesselton. Uh, they are trying their very best to stop the process moving forward. So they're trying uh, to enlist support from all the Bono uh, political parties to form an anti-Malaysia stand and then to send a delegation to the United Nations. They tried their very best to see as many politicians, leading politicians that could accept Don Stevens and Tun Mustafa. They didn't see anybody, any of those two um, individuals, and they didn't see anybody from Unko and um, Usha. So they tried to go for the others, and the others just turned them away and said, we've made up our mind we're going forward with this Malaysia plan at this point in time. Next, please. Uh, so Azari and Stephen seem to have been particularly disappointed in the failing to secure support from the Chinese especially. And um, so again, they made no attempt to contact Stevens or supporters of UNCO and also Mustafa. And the only person on whom they made any impression on again was Sundang. Sundang's the only one that listens to them and says, yes, I, I agree with you, but uh, they then made contact with the Indonesian consul and were then went to the Indonesian embassy here in Jesselton and they had a private meeting that lasted two and a half hours with the consular staff and um, the Indonesian consul for North Borneo. Next please. Okay, so again I go back in time as a reminder, 21st July 1961 uh, during the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association Conference of Singapore. Now, I'm, this is I think where Stevens changed his mind. He's never been to Singapore before this period of time, to my understanding, my knowledge. He's not been to Singapore before this day. And I went to Singapore as a very young boy when I was 11 years old, 1984. And I came from a little island called Labuan. Any of you that know Labuan in the 1980s know basically how simple life was. And Jesselton was a, a simple city, clean city, was generally modernized, but it was not Singapore. Nothing like Singapore, nothing like Kuala Lumpur. Would you agree with that statement? Yeah. So he is now saying, 21st July, the people of Borneo did not reject the proposal once and for all. We're still open to it. You know, he's impressed with what he's seen. Next please. Now, what's interesting in this particular meeting, and it's only these three people that are attending this particular conference. Donald, OKK Zainal bin Karahu, who's not really a big decision maker. You would have thought that Tun Mustafa, Datuk Mustafa would have been there maybe. Pang Tet Sung, who I think became a minister later, Mustafa. They attend the meeting, it's only three people. But you know what's interesting? Who else is missing from here? UP don't have anybody there, Usno, okay, they've got him. Uh, Paso don't have anybody there. So it's just basically Donald that's really taking charge of this particular meeting. Next, please. Can you play the video? This is Singapore in the 1960s. Now, in your mind, those of you that grew up in this period of time, I want you to think about what Jesselton was like at that period of time and compare the vibrancy of Singapore, the wealth of Singapore to 
loved one or just certain or Sanaka. Housing, community housing and flats, playgrounds, education, entertainment, infrastructure, a thriving economy. You could own a car. Or you could just cycle on the road in Orchard Road. They had airports with modern aircraft, which of course we had that as well. They had tourism, which we didn't have at that period of time. Shopping, cloth, development. Money was being spent to develop Singapore. Again, thriving economy, trade, jobs, food on the table every day. Maybe three meals a day, not three meals a day, two meals a day. Food centers, hawkers, interracial relationships. In those days, got videos already. Eh? Yes. Only in Singapore, not here. I haven't found any more yet. Yeah, that period. After, after yeah. Malaysia swam, yes. Yes. So yeah. But if you get the gist of what I'm trying to say, if you're Donald Stevens and you're the three other, the two other gentlemen that fly with Donald Stevens, and you are the 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 group from Sarawak that are going for this meeting, you arrive in Singapore for the very first time you're going to get a shock. It's nothing you've ever seen before and imagine how developed Singapore is. And Lee Kuan Yew is, he is working his socks off to convince Tom Kuhl, let's fall, let's fall. And he does the same thing with Stevens, I believe he did. So I go back to this story when I first arrived in Singapore in 1984 as an 11-year-old, I had a scholarship to study in a private uh, secondary school there. Yeah? I went to the Changi Airport and I got a shock of my life. You know, it's just a different world from where I came from. Everything was so modern, everything was so clean. Infrastructure, bus services, there was a taxi system. It was just a, a different world. So I am trying to imagine what was going through Donald Stevens' mind when he arrived in Singapore and what he saw. Did this convince him that this was a good idea? That's something to consider. Did this change his mind? Lee Kuan Yew, and I come back to this negotiating part. How many of you have negotiated deals before in the past? And it's the hardest thing. You don't always get things your way. Sometimes you win, sometimes it's a draw. You sort of mitigate, you come to a sort of, um, you know, let's just, just call it even. We'll do it. Let's, let's find a solution to this. And sometimes you just, negotiations fail. Lee Kuan Yew did his very best, I'm sure, to convince all sales, hey, this is a really good deal for you. Look, look at us. This can be the same for you as well in Sabah. So did this make an impression? Did this particular conference change Donald's mind? We don't know. But what is knowledgeable, is what we know is that as soon as he arrives back in Jesselton, he gets off the plane, he announces Malaysia is on, without consulting his other partners. And it catches everybody by surprise. So the UP guys, hey, what is this? You know, okay, UP wasn't, I think in 61, but they all get caught out. Hey, what's this? You didn't discuss with us first, you know? You're already announcing, you know, that this is a possibility, so. Yeah. Next, please. The, the issue is, he was convinced by the to join Malaysia, to so, so he finishes this meeting, he finishes his conference, and then immediately Tunku invites him to KL. He flies to KL. So he's in KL for quite a few days, and then I think Tunku did the same thing. He said, look, look at Kuala Lumpur. Look at what we have, look how modern Kuala Lumpur is. Look how vibrant it is. And I suspect the same thing happened there as well. You know, they were just trying their very best. Each, Lee Kuan Yew and Tunku had their own reasons for needing Borneo. Because I think in, in Lee Kuan Yew's mind, the only way that this merger is going to happen if the Borneo states join, then Tunku will be appeased. And we need this to happen. And in Tunku's mind, said, oh, well, the only thing that's ever going to happen as far as the merger is concerned is provided the Borneo states join as a counterweight to balance out the, uh, the number of Chinese versus Malays. But the problem now is, 
they were convinced by Singapore to join Malaysia, but when Singapore left Malaysia, why did Singapore bring Sabah and Sarawak out? Because you didn't do that. It's one of those questions I think that will be talked about and asked beyond my generation. You are before my generation, you lived through that period of time. I would suggest that maybe things are not as simple as they may seem. Singapore left because they were asked to leave. We were not asked to leave, we were asked to stay. We tried, I think if you, if you read communications and documents, we tried, Donald did indicate me. He did try, but he was probably told, don't even you know, think about it, don't bother. And look what happened to Kalong and Sarawak. How long did he remain as chief minister there? He gets removed. Who replaces him? Thai. You know, they have a legal case there. If Kalong's fighting with the federal government, he, he wins, he still gets replaced. I mean, in the end, you look at what happens to Donald Stevens. Donald no, Stevens too was uh, placed and sent as a high commissioner to Canberra. <laughs> that was to remove him. And that comes a little bit later. <laughs> but that is probably nothing to do with the Singapore question. That is other reasons. Which <coughs> I, would, I don't think I'll get to. I think it's really there. Yeah. Um, can we move forward to the next one? Oh, sorry, yeah. Personal invitation to Kuala Lumpur by Tukul Rahman immediately after the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. So again, he repeats this again, 16 August. There is no intention on the part of Malaya to, to, or for any form of colonization of the Borneo territories. The Malaysian plan was workable and we must get down to something concrete. This is his statement in Kuala Lumpur. Immediately after the Singapore conference. And this is where I talk about him changing directions. Was he convinced by Lee Kuan Yew and Tunku? Look at us. Look at how developed we are and look at you. Next please. And so we get to a period of 67 to 76. Now I'm not going to talk about uh, what transpires after 67. What I will share with you is uh, readings. Two weeks ago I had a, a two hour discussion with the grandson of um, Idris Harun, who was one of the warlords, one of the strong men in Amno. He was the Chief Minister of, uh, is it Chief Minister? No. Pardon? Mantri Basar, sorry. Mantri Basar of Slango. Okay. For the longest time. So I talked to his grandson. Uh, so, you know, there's this notion that Idris is a radical right wing politician. So we had a very good conversation. Um, and I think I suggested to, and I'll get to what the point I'm trying to make, um, that within Amno itself, you have the inner circle of Tunku, Raza, and all the senior elders of Amno. It's an inner circle, you cannot get in this inner circle. And outside of this inner circle is all the up and coming educated youth who are fundamentally for preserving and improving the lives of the Malays. Go back to that period of time, the Malays were extremely poor. You cannot deny this fact. And what they saw was that Tunku was not doing enough to help the Malays to get out of this cycle of poverty. He was not doing enough and he was in his own little world. So when I talked to Harun's grandson, he gave me another um, proposal. Actually, there's three groups, it's not two, it's three. And the radicals that you talk about, actually, it's the Mahathir group. These are the up and coming youngsters who have a very different mindset. They are completely on the right. Tunku's in the middle, he tends to be a gentleman, he's pretty okay, you know, he's, he, he keeps his word, but he's under a lot of pressure. Tunku, one could argue, is not a politician. He's a gentleman, he's a prince, but he cannot play this political game that these guys are playing. These guys are vibrant, they're young, energetic, and they can see the problems in the Malay community at that time. So they are doing all they can to change the narrative. So I get to 67. Now, I talked earlier about the Tau case, how much influence the Tau case had and would have in the future of Sabah. At some point in time, if again, if you read this book, uh, the Tau case of Sabah, it will tell you the reasons why. Stevens did something which upset them. He was doing a number of things that upset them, and it was going to affect their bread and butter, timber concessions. Why he decided to do that? 
So when you get to this period, the 67 elections, you need these Taukes, you need their support, and they're not there. So it's a tie, 67 is a tie, the elections are a tie. Stevens doesn't stand in the elections. He steps back because he made a promise to Tunku, okay, fine, I won't get involved in the elections, you know, rather than him getting kicked out from politics. But what's interesting is that you have the first person that jumps from uh, Apko to Usu. The first incident where somebody is actually... Okay, there's no evidence of this. I've not seen the evidence. One could suggest that he was enticed to jump and then to change the numbers across. If the Chinese Tao case had supported um, Apko in a period of time, I think Apko would have, been, would have won this election comfortably, but they side with Usu. Dr. Uh, Dr. Mustafa has a good relationship with them. In fact, he's chair chairman of the Timber Association, which kind of helps, right? So, this ultimately is one of the reasons that Anko comes to an end. It actually begins in 64. April and May 64, there's a um, they try to remove Stevens as chief, uh, chief minister. They're unsuccessful. Um, but this is really the beginning, and there's actually a report, a confidential intelligence report, between two senior APCO politicians, UNCO, pol UNCO politicians, UNCO, UNCO politicians in KL during these negotiations with UMNO. It's a very tense meeting. Usno is there and they're making demands. We want Stevens gone. You know, I want to appoint somebody. We want to appoint somebody else as chief minister. It's got to be from Usno. Uh, APCO is fighting back. It's a very serious confrontation. It goes on for three days. They so Tunku is in the middle trying to negotiate with both sides. And in this private conversation in the hotel room with an Australian diplomat, these two senior APCO leaders are, are expressing their frustration. I mean, it all comes out. I'm, I'm not going to publish it. It's sensitive. Um, but they're just letting everything out, you know. You see these guys now, you see they're not keeping their word and so forth. So that's really the start of the end of um, Apko, pretty much that. But it's what happens beforehand, what they do with the Taukes, they upset the Taukes. And when you need them, they don't side with you. So and I think that plays a very important role in what transpires thereafter, where uh, eventually Tonku uh, resigns, uh, Razak comes into office, Mustafa becomes chief minister, he steps down as a TYT and then he stands and wins elections in 67 and becomes chief minister. It's this guy. This is the guy, he's a problem solver, he solves problems. He's a very intelligent lawyer, uh, very ambitious. He sees the world very differently from many other uh, Amno politicians. He's not in, in, the, in the inner circle, Tonku's inner circle. But he's invited in because of his relationship with the information minister at that particular period of time. Uh, and they send him to Sabah to go and solve this crisis and to sort out this mess. So he goes in 65. Uh, so he's here, he gets the lay of the ground, and his housemate is not just anybody, it's the special branch officer for, for, for North Borneo. They stay together. So he's getting everything fed to him what's going on, who's doing this, and who's doing that. So he's getting access to all the special branch files as well. So, yeah, so he comes, he solves, he gets Usno into power, Apko comes to an end not too long after that, and there's only really one person left in the end of it. All the other independent opposition leaders all get arrested uh, when the emergency is declared 6970, they all get up in Kapayan. It's only Peter Majuntin that's left, really, to and him and uh, Mustafa have some of the worst fights you can imagine. Uh, this is coming from first hand uh, knowledge of somebody who was in between these arguments. And it's it's him. He just antagonizes to Mustafa as often as he can. He just tells what he thinks to put Mustafa's face directly. So there is a lot of animosity, but there's only one guy left fighting him. It's him. Peter. Next please. So I talked about these three Circles. I, I, I actually thought of two. And um, so Harun's grandson said, no, 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 have a look at this. It's actually three groups. It, my grandfather also had his own group, and it's actually true. So this is from Malay Politics in Malaysia by John Funston. This came out in 1973. Funston talks about three major groups within UMNO. One centered around the youth leaders, 
Idris Harun, so he's got his own group. There's another comprised of the old guard, which is Tunku's group, this inner circle that I talk about. They are in charge. Um, and they, again, they talk about Tunku's cautious. He's, he's, he has his, you know, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. You know, people are warning him, hey, you're going to have problems. He just has his attitude. In the end, he's broken as a person, as a politician. He is broken because of what transpires during the May riots in 69. Um, he's a broken man. If you read the communications, the letters that he writes, he cannot believe that the riots have happened. It's caught him, you know, he's in shock. He cannot believe that it, is, it has come down to this. He's no longer the same person anymore. Um, and then the third group is this younger up and coming group of ultras. The word ultras is already used already in that period of time. Critical of developments prior to 1969. They felt that, the, that they were the best people to undertake the complex feat of social engineering required to correct prevailing injustices. This is the Mahathir group, that group with that kind of ideology, the right wingers. So Idris Harun is actually not the person people think he is, that he's right wing. He's kind of in the middle. And you'd be surprised, a lot of people that actually surrounded him were actually Indians and Chinese. So if you say Idris Harun was a racist, no, it would not appear so if you base it on facts in documents. It's this other group. But they blame him for me the in. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, the other thing also, you have to bear in mind, you have to bear in mind, sometimes things happen, it's not the person you think, it's people behind that are instigating things. It's not always what you think. You may think that this person has said such and such a thing, and you may think he's the person responsible, but you forget there are political secretaries, there are other politicians around you, the other politicians in Slamov. Idris Harun is not the only politician in Slamov, there are many others. I know the name of the person that actually instigated the 69 riots. It's not Idris Harun, it's another politician that has name has disappeared. You don't see it in any documents, it's somebody else. Um, so when we talked about, I talked about it with his grandson, you know, he's trying to understand, you know, what transpired, why did my grandfather end up in prison on corruption charges, you know. So it was interesting talking, but he made it, you know, he's given me some evidence to look at. I've studied it. It seems to hold some merit. Yeah, it seems to hold some merit. So I'm sorry to bring up the, the, the riots and all that, but it's all interconnected with what transpired. Because once the emergency is declared, what does Mustafa do? He arrests all the opposition. They all go to Kapaya and that's it. Nobody to stop them. They do what they want. And again, I come back to this gentleman, Shantichik, who's a very intelligent guy. He sorts things out, you know. They develop a Sala Foundation and so forth on, on generally good, they have good intentions that they want to improve the education. You can see, we don't have the infrastructure for education. We don't have the population that's educated. So they actually, in the beginning, have good intentions. Of course, things change later. So that's for different. Yeah, during the, the May 13, when the local Sabahans were arrested, yeah. uh, some of them were forced to sell land to those bastards. My dad was one of them. So I know who are the bastards. Next, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer some yeah, of them. Yeah, always say, always, <coughs> in any way, always. What is next for Sabah? About the MA 63 independence or what they were? Uh, this is a topic that is beyond my understanding and knowledge. It is for the experts. They are experts in this field. They are knowledgeable about this far more than I ever will. I, If you asked me one year ago, would I have touched on this topic? My answer would have been no. I only stopped in 1945 and I go backwards in history and I studied that particular area. How I ended up in this is because I was trying to figure out why is my grandfather with United Party? <laughs> why is he an Indian in this photograph with, <laughs> with cool Peter Law and all that? You know, so th that's the only reason it started this this whole sort of test. And this is what I've discovered. Uh, it's been interesting. It's been fascinating trying to understand the reasons why. Why did we get into this? I'm, I'm your neighbor also. I used to live in Kalaga. Ah, Kalaga the old yeah, that before they changed the name to Jumira Buyo. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's my question. Yeah. Actually, I was just on the break of point. You see, the thing is, during the negotiations of formation of uh, Malaysia, you look at the Sabah Rex. Sabah Rex is Kumar Sabah and um, Kusak Joe. And then, of course, Bernard uh, Sabah. The, the, the level of applications, 
that one, I don't know how much we have time, but our store is 15 minutes to go through a primary school. And then the uh, dollar silver, it might be secondary school. Yeah. yeah? And then, um, so, who, I think they hardly speak English, Chinese, right? Because it's very really uh -huh. important. Then, you see, the only graduate in the whole team, actually, is Peter Law. Yeah. He's a lawyer. Okay. And then he graduated from, I don't know, Australia or, Ch or UK or anywhere, right? So just like you were saying that um, you, you made a point that uh, what made Donald Stephen change his mind was after he, he see how robust is Singapore and so on and so forth. Yeah? But then you see, in, 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 in Borneo at that time, we also have some uh, well-educated academic. Yes. Yeah? And these people go and have uh, Hawaii's Donald Stevens or Mishako? I think and even the British officers. Yeah. Yeah? The British officers, it's very clear on the document, the British officers are absolutely against joining. That is well documented. I have not seen any that actually promoted against. More than I've seen every they're all against it until the very end. In fact, this these guys that are against it remain as officers. Okay? They remain as officers after Malaysia is formed and there are big fights in the state secretary between them and the federal officer who is sent over to, rule, to run the federal departments here. He's a Chinese gentleman, not Malay. He's having massive fights with them in the office. Everybody can hear it and it is so vulgar and rude and loud that the diplomats in KL are trying to ask them, can you please replace it? He's not very helpful. So they are trying, they're trying but they've got no hope. There's no way. Yes, uh, Tom Mustafa may be not educated. Um, we know he came from a certain part of the Philippines, migrated here as a very young boy, grew up here as a Sabahan. Um, but in his mind, uh, he was supportive of the formation of Malaysia from the very beginning. He had already been convinced this was the way forward. Stevens was not convinced. Stevens. Now, if you went into a room and you wanted to negotiate, and you had to choose between Mustafa and Stevens, and let's assume that who? Is there as well. So between these three gentlemen, Peter Law is not in the picture at this point in time. Of these three, who would the, pro, the British government want to negotiate with? Who are these three would you choose? Mustafa, Stevens, or who? Stevens is mentioned. They talk about him being Eurasian, he's half uh, Kadazan, half um, uh, Europe, British, Australian. Australian. Australian or something. So they talk about him being, oh, he's one of us. We can <coughs> talk, we can sit. Stevens is a very, he can entertain people, he can talk well, he speaks well, he's a man of the world, sort of sees things. He may not have grown up in Singapore or Kuala Lumpur, but he's, they can get along with him, they, they feel they can negotiate with him, and that's really the reason why they go along with Stevens. Over, over Mustafa, and, and so I think one of you mentioned that who couldn't really speak English, that may be the reason why. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I'm just wondering, all right, yeah. you know, uh, out of this four years, yeah, we were talking about education and all that, yes. at that point in time, uh, there's only one guy who, who went to England and studied for a year, right, now, and that was J.S. Sudan. Sudan, yes, but you know, they're not going to come to Sudan, they've tried. Mm. He's actually adamant, no, I'm not yes. even going to consider it. So, if you can't negotiate with somebody that refuses to negotiate, what's the point? Mm -hmm. And that's really the reason why. They just put him aside, okay, we'll talk to Stephen instead. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. A uh, few observations because I lived during that time. Yes, you did. And uh, I think uh, I'll be sorry I'm film about Singapore. Yeah. And I just happened to go as a Boy Scout there in 1967 or so. Yes. You know? So it wasn't like what it was in the movie. Yeah? Okay.
And when the decision is made to participate and to join Malaysia, it catches a lot of stakeholders out, stakeholders being um, other members of political parties representing different communities. They are taken by surprise that decision has been made without consultation and without reaching a consensus. So they have no choice but to follow along. However, during that period of time, over the next year, that would, from 62, sort of August, September 1962, into August and September 1963, a number of things happen. And um, what is clear in the end, uh, those that were opposed or those that were very cautious and wanted safeguards before we committed to participating in the union and formation of Malaysia, were very adamant in protecting the rights um, not only of the people of Sabah, but also to ensure the protection of the resources of the state. So they already could see problems coming further down the road and they were very adamant, look, we've got to put these safeguards in. Um, and if we don't do this, it's going to be a significant problem further down the road. And of course, as we move forward 60 years, you can see how some of those problems now exist. Um, I won't get into what those issues are. I think most of you already know what those problems are. But what I would like to highlight is that they already were alarmed and we tend to ignore uh, the Chinese who play a very significant role, um, not only in 1963 in getting the Chinese community to commit to agreeing to participate, but what significantly happens thereafter leading up to the elections in 1967. And it's the Chinese vote that makes a big, big difference in ensuring that Usno wins. And of course, another significant thing that happens is that a member of the UNCO, uh, UPCO political party uh, switches sides and swings uh, the vote in favor of Usno and everything changes thereafter. Now, I used Singapore as a very important point because um, when key members go to Singapore for a conference and it's the very first time they are going to Singapore to visit, they see a very developed, a very wealthy, a thriving economy in Singapore. They see public housing. They see um, great amounts of trade and wealth. And the most important thing, they see development and they see jobs, which is severely lacking in North Borneo at that period of time. They're then invited to go to Kuala Lumpur and they see how developed Kuala Lumpur is. They are basically encouraged. They receive a lot of talking to from uh, Lee Kuan Yew and Tunku over this period of 10 to 12 to 14 days. And at this point in time, they sort of come to the realization that, look, it may not be a bad idea to participate and join the union, provided we can protect and we can ensure the safeguards are in place. What I am trying to point out significantly is that we ignore the Chinese contribution and we ignore the fact that they play a very important role in the decision making. So I'm talking specifically about the United Party and the Democratic Party. And these two parties tend to get ignored. We only tend to talk about Usno and APCO. But you have to remember United Party and Democratic Party play a significant role. And this is the point I've been trying to make. Thank you to everybody who attended the talk. Um, I'll try to share um, some aspects of my talk over the next few weeks in parts. It will be probably in two or three parts to keep it short, but to the point. But Sabah Society will be producing uh, a copy of last night's talk uh, very soon, and they'll be sharing it as well. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a very good weekend.